On the previous episode, we created two different machine learning models for our anomaly detection system. One relied on the Mahalanobis distance, and the other used neural networks. This time, let's look at one possible way we can deploy these models. We're going to run the same code on our ESP32 node that we did in the first episode. All it does is pipe about one second's worth of accelerometer data to our server running on our Raspberry Pi. The Pi is in charge of taking this raw data, extracting features, which is the median absolute deviation in our case, and running it through our machine learning model to perform inference. The output of this inference will be a number that we can compare to a simple threshold. If it's equal to or less than the threshold, we'll say the fan is operating normally. If it's above it, we'll say there's an anomaly. Note that the Pi in this case can really be any computer, but I wanted to specifically show how to run an AI algorithm on a low-powered edge device. We're going to be using the same HTTP REST method from the first episode to get the data from the ESP32 to the server. The ESP32 will query the server to see if it's ready, the server will respond with a 1 if it is ready to receive new data, and the ESP32 will send all of the accelerometer data in JSON format that was collected over one second. The one real problem I found is that we collected samples from the fan in one particular state. So if you moved the fan around, or even moved the accelerometer, it changed the state, which means the model didn't work any longer. I found that even taking off the ESP32 and accelerometer, making a few changes, and then trying to put it back in the same spot, it never quite worked. One way around this is to collect data and train a new model each time you wish to deploy. That means we set up the ESP32 as a transmitter, strap it to the fan, turn it on, and leave it there. Then we run our collection process again, but just for the fan in the low speed, what we consider to be a normal state. We run just the parts of our training code that builds and trains the model, as we won't have anomaly samples to test the model against. We let the ESP32 keep running and transmitting accelerometer data. Then, we move the trained model over to the Raspberry Pi and run just inference on the Pi. That will read raw accelerometer values from the ESP32 and use them to predict whether the fan is running normally or not. Note again that this only works while the fan is in that very particular state. If I move it, or the accelerometer, we need to start this whole process over again. This is somewhat indicative of what the deployment process would look like anyway. Since no two fans work exactly the same, you'd probably want to automate the process on the assembly line during the testing phase. You'd collect vibration data about that particular motor and construct a model unique to that motor's normal operation before sending it to the customer. Or even better, you'd have the customer perform a startup sequence so that a model can be created that takes into account the customer's operating environment. Note that this probably requires running the training algorithm on the customer's phone, computer, or remote server. For now, let's get our anomaly detection system working on the fan, even if it's just for one state. To start, let's make sure that we have the ESP32 running code from the first episode. If you remember, the code simply captures about 200 data points from the accelerometer and then transmits them in JSON format to our server. We'll change the server address to point to our Raspberry Pi. We'll once again attach our sensor node to the ceiling fan. I'm going to mark out a spot in masking tape so that I can try to get the breadboard back in the same spot every time. Then I'll just connect this big battery to it and let it run. If you have not done so already, make sure you are using Python 3 and PIP 3. I like to add a couple of alias lines in my bash RC script so that when I enter Python in the terminal, I get Python 3. In the Raspberry Pi, I'll run the same server code from episode 1 to collect about 20 minutes of raw accelerometer data. Note that I'm just collecting samples with the fan on low and no weights added and saving the data under a separate deploy folder. I took the Jupyter Notebook for training and testing the Mahalanobis distance method and converted it into a training script that can easily be run on the Raspberry Pi. Note that I took out anomaly samples. We're just working with the deployment samples that we just captured. Additionally, we're just working with a validation and training set, no test set either. Everything else should be the same. Training is just computing the median absolute deviation of the training samples and then finding the mean and covariance matrix of those. At the end, we calculate the Mahalanobis distance between each validation sample and the mean of the training set. 
This should give us an idea of what the threshold we should use. Run the script, and it should read in the deployment samples, compute the model, and save it to a .npz file. It should also give us a recommended threshold for our detection code. The server code is very similar to the server code from the first episode. The difference here is that we're using NumPy to load in our .npz model file, which contains the mean and covariance matrices that we just calculated. Let's jump down to where the code script really starts. The only parameter I have for the script now is the port number. After that, it loads the model file and saves the mean and covariance matrices in global variables. The rest is the same as before, it starts a new thread that handles incoming HTTP requests. Let's jump up to the HTTP handler function. We see that responding to a git request is the same, but for a post request, we no longer store the raw data in a file. Instead, we compute the median absolute deviation using the function we created in the last episode and then compute the Mahalanobis distance between the received set of samples and the model's mean. We compare the Mahalanobis distance to the threshold we estimated from the previous episode and print out whether we think the data indicates there is an anomaly or not. In essence, this is a combination of the server code from the first episode and the Mahalanobis distance calculation code from the second episode. When we run the server code, the ESP32 should connect to it and begin sending it 200 accelerometer measurements every other second or so. However, instead of storing them as CSV files, we're going to compute the median absolute deviation and Mahalanobis distance of the MAD values from the training set's mean. It should be pretty low, under our threshold value, indicating this is normal operation. I'm going to carefully tape a coin to one of the fan blades. Hmm, it seems that one coin isn't enough to give us an anomaly right away. Every now and then, we might see one pop up. Let's see if we can detect an anomaly with two coins. It certainly doesn't show up every time, but we start to see a few more anomalies being reported. Now, if I do something like hit the blades with my hand, we can clearly see the Mahalanobis distance jump up into the thousands, telling us something is very wrong. So, the Mahalanobis distance detection system does work well for obvious anomalies, but it seems to miss some of the more subtle ones. Let's try this again using our autoencoder. Installing full TensorFlow on the Raspberry Pi was more trouble than it was worth, so I'm going to train the deployment model on my laptop. Similar to what we did with the Mahalanobis distance training, we're just looking at the samples we captured at the beginning of the episode and leaving out the anomaly samples. We run through the notebook again and train the autoencoder a few times until we get something with low validation loss. We can look at what most of the mean squared error values end up being for the normal samples and guess a decent threshold value, but know that it might still need to be tweaked in deployment. Once we're happy with the new model, we can save it as a .h5 Keras file. I'll make sure it's saved with a different file name so that it doesn't overwrite the original model. Then, we want to use the TensorFlow Lite converter function to create a TF Lite model file out of our Keras model. This will create a smaller file that can be loaded onto things like single board computers and smartphones. Finally, we can use Netron to open the file and check that all of the layers and matrix dimensions look correct. Let's take a look at the server code that will run on the Raspberry Pi. This works very similar to the Mahalanobis distance server script that we made earlier. Before starting the server, we load the TensorFlow Lite interpreter and allocate the input and output buffers. Then, in the parse samples function, we calculate the median absolute deviation and copy them into the TensorFlow Lite input buffer. The magic happens at this interpreter.invoke function, which performs the actual inference steps using the neural network we trained and our data. From there, we get the prediction values and calculate the mean squared error between them and the input MAD values. If the mean squared error is over some value, we note that an anomaly has occurred. This threshold value is set based on what we learned during the training sequence, but might need to be adjusted some based on how the system performs. Let's install TensorFlow Lite on our Raspberry Pi and run the program. If you navigate to the Python Quick Start Guide for TensorFlow Lite, you'll see the wheel file locations. Copy the one for the ARM 32-bit processor, or whatever your Raspberry Pi is running, and install it using pip. Use whatever means to get the updated autoencoder server code and TF Lite model onto your Raspberry Pi and then run it. 
With no coins on the fan blades, we should see low mean squared error values, meaning everything is normal. Let's add one coin to the fan blade again. Just like with the Mahalanobis distance method, we see only a few anomalies pop up every now and then. Let's add another coin. And again, we get a few more anomalies. Not many, but just a few. Let's try touching the fan blades again. We see that this causes the mean squared error values to jump up several orders of magnitude, showing us that our system definitely works when there's an obvious problem. Unfortunately, we've constructed two models that only seem to work in very specific circumstances. I've found that if I move the breadboard even a little bit, it throws the whole system off and I have to retrain the model. However, I hope this is enough to get you started thinking about your own anomaly detection system. If you want to check out the code, it can be found in a link in the description. And happy hacking! <laughs>